بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجين والفرقان الحميد بعد أن أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أدعوا ربكم تضرعا وخفية إنه لا يحب المعتدين صدق الله العظيم <clears throat> the topic of du'a is very, very vast. It is so vast, there are so many different perspectives and aspects to it that we can't look into every single one, so we're going to look at a couple. Just a couple. One of the most famous du'as in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us, is Rabbana habdana min azwajina wa dhurriyatina qurrata a'yun wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama Surah Al-Furqan The meaning of this dua, the rough translation is O oh Allah, hablana, gift us min azwajina from our spouses wa dhurriyatina and our children qurrata a'yun the coolness of our eyes wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama Qurrata a'yun means coolness of the eyes. What does coolness of the eyes mean? Let, let's go into that a little bit. Qurrata a'yun is an Arabic phrase or idiom used to show contentment, used to show pleasure for something. So to say that someone's eyes are cool is to say that person is happy with the state that they're in. And the opposite is also true. To say that someone's eyes are warm is a curse. So the Arabs, when, when they wanted to curse someone, they would sometimes, they would say, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make your eyes warm. Meaning that when a person cries and he's in grief, tears come out of his eyes, his eyes become warm. So Arabs used to say that as, as a curse to other people. But qurrata a'yun means the coolness of a person's eyes. Meaning that he's very content, he's very happy with the state that he's in. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not saying anything else. All Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that make our spouses and make our kids a source of coolness of our eyes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have said, ask me to make good spouses and good children for you that will listen to you all the time. That is not the dua. The dua is, Ya Allah, whenever I see my family, whether it's a male or a female, whenever it's whenever I see them, Ya Allah, please make it in such a way, just make that situation in such a way that I am happy by seeing them, just by seeing them. Let's go into Qur'an Ta'ayun a little bit more. When Musa salam was born, his mother put him inside a box. I want you to imagine that. An infant child and the mother is putting that infant child into a box and she has absolutely no idea what's gonna happen to the child she puts him inside the box and she she puts the box never one of the duas and one of the states the statements that she makes at that time that later on in life when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was talking to Musa alayhi salam. He was saying that, remember when your mother put you inside the box and her eyes, and she was feeling so much grief, she was so sad. Remember that moment? And then you went throughout your entire life and then at the end Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returned you back to your mother. So her eyes would be cool. We returned you to your mother so her eyes would be cool. So it's not just one place in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses it in multiple places. So I want to get to, I want to make everyone understand the purpose of that dua, the reality and appreciate the dua. Qurrata a'yun means that when you look at something, automatically just by looking at that thing, you feel happy, you feel content. Whether that thing is perfect or not. A lot of us, we don't have perfect homes. We don't live in mansions. 
I don't live in a mansion, you, you probably don't live in a mansion either. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us, but let's speak reality. A lot of us don't live in, in the biggest homes that we want to be living in. Obviously, we're inside, we want more and more and more. But, you know what they say, a house isn't where the building is large or where the structure is huge. But, you know, some people say a house is where you can use the bathroom peacefully. But, that, that's not really what I'm trying to say. A house is basically a place that you go and you feel happy and secure within that place. Am I right or am I wrong? So, a, basically a house isn't the structure. A house is more spiritual. And nowadays our houses are virtual as well. We got everything on our phones. Everything on our phones. So that's also like a house to us. So, throughout the, throughout the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions different du'as that different prophets made at different times. And usually that du'a is basically used when transitioning from one phase to another phase in life. Let me give you an example of Musa alayhi salam again. Musa alayhi salam, he was put inside the box, he was sent into the river. He was flowing inside the river. Fir'aun's wife, may Allah have peace upon her. She was also a Muslim, she believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She saw him and she picks him up and it's amazing, even she uses the word. That, you know, we should take this child and he'll be a coolness of our eyes. He'll be a coolness of my eye and your eyes as well. Remember, one of the things over here is, remember they were husband and wife. Fir'aun and his wife, they were husband and wife. Fir'aun being the greatest the greatest evil person of, of that time or of all time and the wife being a Muslim how is that possible look at the friction within that one household but look at the way she says that sentence the way it's structured she says he can be a coolness for my eye and your eyes as well she didn't say she, he can be a coolness for both of our eyes us, she didn't say that. Because even in that, she was separating herself from Fir'aun. Now there are times where people are in such situations where it's hard to get away from that situation. For example, someone is in, someone has a domestic violence within their house. That is not a small issue. Violence within the household is very, very dangerous. Outside, other people will see it. People will be like, what's wrong with this guy? They will take care of it. But within the household, it's, it's, it's not really visible to people. <coughs> so that's why some people are in those kind of situations where they literally have nowhere to go. But remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always helps those kind of people. Always. Look at the wife of Fir'aun. She was in the most desperate of situations and look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped her. How he took Fir'aun out and he kept her there. And he mentions her in the Quran. In the Quran. So when she picks up Musa alayhi salam, she says to Fir'aun, he can be a coolness of my eyes and your eyes. And then Musa alayhi salam, he grows up that when Musa السلام, grew up, he grew to his maturity level. A lot of scholars say that was the age of 33, around that age. We gave him wisdom and knowledge. After that, Musa السلام, was sent to two different types of people. First of all, Musa alayhi salam was sent to Fir'aun, his own people, Egyptian people, because Musa alayhi salam was born and raised in that, in that place. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put his first mission as, assigned his first mission as, go to Fir'aun and his people, 
give them the da'wah of Islam. After that, we'll see. So for years and years, Musa salam was giving da'wah to Fir'aun, giving da'wah to the people. And the entire di dialogues and conversations are mentioned within the Qur'an. It's different places in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, different mentions it with different words. So Musa alayhi salam, he was there for years and years. Musa alayhi salam, he made a mistake. What happened was, <clears throat> there were two people fighting, one from his own people, and one random person, not from his people. So he saw the two fighting, and the person that was from his tribe or clan, he called upon Musa, he said, Ya Musa, look at what this guy is doing to me, can you help me? Musa punched him so hard that he died. Just one punch. He knocked him out. One shot, one kill. That's what they call it, right? <clears throat> so that's what it was. One shot and he's dead. <laughs> and no one knew about this at that time. Now, maybe the next day or a couple of days later, that guy was in some trouble again. And he calls upon Musa alayhi salam. And Musa alayhi salam advances towards him. And the guy thought, man, he's going to kill me now. Yesterday he killed the person I was fighting with. Put the wire on. <clears throat> so the person, he says that you killed the other person yesterday, and now you want to kill me? Even though Musa Ali set up, it looked like he was advancing towards him, but he was going to help him. So basically, by that person saying that, he revealed Musa Ali Salaam. He exposed him. And due to that reason, Musa alayhi salam was hunted by the police. Because the person he initially killed was a police officer. If you kill a normal if a normal person is murdered, for example, if a normal person is murdered, there is a police case, there's an investigation, and they do their best to find out the person who killed him. A lot of times they are successful. But if you if a, a police officer is killed, that's that's game over. The city goes into a, a sort of lockdown, and everyone is looking for that person who murdered that police officer. It's game over for the person. <clears throat> so everyone's looking for Musa alayhi salam, and Musa alayhi salam doesn't know what to do. He gets the wahi from Allah subhanahu wa taala to leave Egypt. So he left Egypt, he goes into the, de the desert. Now remember, when you're walking inside the desert and you don't have, you don't have a sense of compass, you literally, everywhere you look is the exact same. Especially at that time, every direction that you look in, it's the exact same direction. So you don't have any idea where you're going. Now obviously this was, a, this was an order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps those people who listen to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Musa alayhi salam went straight towards Madian Not here and there, straight Remember he's going, he's leaving Egypt without a compass Without any directions, without a map, nothing And who's helping him? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he's driving him straight to Madian Madian was, was further than Egypt was much further when Musa alayhi salam gets to Madian wajada alayhi ummatan bin nasi yaspoon he stops by a while he's tired he was traveling through the desert for days and days and now he finally gets to a city and he sits there, and there's a well over there near near where he's sitting. 
and he finds, when he goes there, he sees a bunch of people, they're feeding their animals by the well. Obviously, that's what wells were used for. They were used for people's homes, they were used for people's houses, they were used for people's animals. That was their livelihood. So when he sees those people, وَجَدَ عَلَيْهِ أُمَّةً مِنَ النَّاسِ يَسْقُونَ وَوَجَدَ مِن دُونِهِمُ مُرَأَتَيْنِ تَذُودَانِ that he sees two women in the back and they're holding their animals back. They're not letting their animals go forward to drink water. And Musa alayhi salam, he sees this and he thinks to himself, he said, everyone's drinking water, they're giving their animals water. Why are these women not letting their animals drink water? What's wrong? Are the, are the animals fasting or something like that? What's what's going on here? He goes up to them. He asks them, what's the matter? That we usually don't go to the well until the people that, that are feeding their animals right now, they're finished. Why? Because those kind of men, they're, they're the other type of men. They, they check us out. They, they, they're pervert men. That's why we're not going to go there. We wait for them to leave, and then we go. Automatically, in a person's mind, the first question is, well, you're two women. Where's the man of the house? Where's the man of the house? What's he doing? And they answer that right after that without Musa salam having to ask. They say, wa abuna shaykhun kabir. They already knew the question is coming, so they already answered that. They said that our father is very old, he can't do this kind of work. So Musa a.s. he fed their animals. Then he went to the shade. He, got, he went and sat under a tree. This is the moral of the story, this coming up section. فَقَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي بِمَا أَنزَلْتَ إِلَيَّ مِنْ خَيْلٍ فَقِيلٍ He makes this dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before I explain the dua, I want to give you an example. There is a doctor. And he's been well off. He has a really, really good job. Really good job. Something happens in his career. Maybe he makes a mistake. And he's laid off. He's fired. Now he doesn't have a job. A month goes by. Two months go by. Six months go by. A year goes by. And he's using his savings right now. Five years go by and still no job. Still no job. And he's run out of savings. What does he do now? He literally has nothing to do. Now someone offers him a job and they say, you know, I have a small clinic. Remember, this is, this is one of the highest paid doctors, a neurosurgeon, let's just say. Cardiovascular surgeon. Making well over half a million dollars per year. And now he has no job. Someone offers him a job in some little clinic and they say, we'll give you $40,000 per year. And he's like, what? Do you even know who I am? But the thing is, he can't say that right now. He's out of a job. He's in desperate need, right? He's in desperate need of a job. So whatever is coming his way, he'll take it. The same way, when Musa is traveling through the desert, he doesn't have anyone with him. No aid, nothing except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this was also a test from Allah. And he's tired and he's thirsty and he's hungry. And he gets to that place and he's sitting by the well. And he sees two women. And they need help. Usually a normal person would be, man, I'm too tired to help them. Do you even know what I've been through? I need help. So Musa a.s. he got up and he helped them and he didn't ask for any money, nothing in exchange, nothing. He went and he sat on the side and he says, رَبِّ إِنِّي لِمَا أَنزَلْتَ إِلَيَّ مِنْ خَيْرٍ فَقِيرٍ O Allah, 
I am in need of whatever good you bestow upon me. I know I am the Prophet of Allah, but you know, I'm in kind of such a need right now that I can't really make those kind of demands. I can't really make those kind of uh, demands from you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anything that you give me right now, please, please give me anything. The women went back home. They told their dad about the story, what happened. They said that there was this, there was this young man, very strong guy, and he fed the animals. The father's like, okay, uh, what did he ask for in, for in return? And the daughter said nothing. And the father is like, okay, so there's a good man. He's not a pervert. He fed your animals for free, and he asked for nothing in return. We got to go meet this guy. <clears throat> so one of the fajaat ihdahuma tamshi ala istihya. So one of them comes back to Musa alayhi salam, one of the daughters. Qalat inna abi yad'uka liyajziyaka ajra ma saqaita lana. That my father is calling you so he may reward you for whatever you've done for us. A normal person like me and you in that situation will be like, you know, I, I did it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't, I don't really need it. We, we show that kind of humility. I did it for Allah. I don't need it. It's good. Our intention is correct. We do it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Musa alayhi salam heard it, he got up right away. And he said, let's go. Because remember, the point of this story is that everything doesn't fall from the sky. We're not at the time of Musa alayhi salam and his people where man and salwa were coming from the sky. It's, it doesn't work that way. A lot of times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses other people to fill our dua, to fulfill our dua. A lot of times, and this is one of the greatest examples in the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using the daughter or the woman to fulfill the dua of Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam said, give me anything, ya Allah. And look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him. So Musa alayhi salam went and the father said, I want to get you married to one of my daughters. He's coming right out of a desert. All he did was feed some animals. And now the father wants to get him married to one of his daughters. Such a short dua, but such a great return. That doesn't mean that if you see a woman and you, you make that dua, the father is going to get you married to that woman. That's just an example. So many times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses other people to fulfill our dua. And a lot of times we don't notice that. We would say that, no, it's okay. But we forget that it, that could be from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That could be the result of our dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As long as we're not asking in front of people. You know, there's a saying that rajari is nas. That the respect of a man is in his istighna from people. That he doesn't ask people for anything. That's part of his self-respect. If there's a person always asking other people for different things, people don't have respect for that person. But if there's a person who has so much self-respect that he doesn't go out of his way and ask people for help or ask people for money or whatever he needs, he only asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's very, very good. But if help is offered to you, that very well could be from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a very, very big chance that that help is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As long as you're not asking for it in your dua, then it could be there's a very, very high chance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent that help your way. Many times we make dua and we think, man, why did Allah not accept my dua? I was so sincere. So sincere. I made it after Fajr Salah. Do you know what I had to do to come for that Fajr? I had to wake up 25 minutes early, get ready, come in the cold, put my jackets on, put my socks on. 
come to the masjid, pray behind the imam, and the imam took so long, first of all. And after that, I made sincere dua. Ya Allah, please give me this. Or Ya Allah, please help me. And Allah is still not helping me. We probably don't say this, but sometimes we think of it that way. And that's okay. We have those questions in mind. Remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't accept our dua always at face value. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alimun khabir. He knows what's good for us and what's not good for us. Maybe that thing that we're asking for is not good for us. It's probably harmful for us. We don't know about the future. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's good and what's bad. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't want that thing to be with us because that's not good for us. If that, if we had that thing, maybe we wouldn't have come for that Fajr Salah. If we had whatever we're asking for, maybe we couldn't have made it to the masjid in the first place. Or maybe it would have caused harm to someone else. So there's three types of, I would say, levels that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts, dua, accepts the du'as. The first one is at face value. You make a du'a for something, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts it at face value. Whatever you ask for, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you that by one mean or another. In this we have to remember that a lot of times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes other people the means of acceptance of our du'a. And we can't just say, man, Allah made you the means, that's it. It's from Allah, but Allah made you the means. I don't have to thank you. Remember the hadith, man lam yashkurin nas lam yashkurillah. Whoever doesn't thank the people, essentially he hasn't thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one of the ways to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if someone does something good to you, you thank that person. You appreciate that person. If someone helps you, you appreciate that person. That is the way to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If someone does something good to you, you can't just pray two salahs nafu and expect that person to be happy. You have to thank that, that person, either verbally or physically, whatever way that you want to do. That's another thing that we sometimes lack on. We're not sure about how to thank people. We're not sure what kind of gifts to give either. Giving gifts is such a hard question. What gift should I give this person? Such a hard question. I think we have a... Back, back home, one of my friends invited me for, for a dawah. This is coming Friday. But he invited me three weeks ago. For the past three weeks, me and, me and my wife have been arguing about what gift that we should give these people. So that question is not an easy one. What kind of gift should we give that person? It's not easy. I would say that whatever your heart feels is a good gift. Whatever you would be happy with people giving you, I think that we can apply that to the other person as well. Physically or verbally, you can thank the other person. Man, you did, you went out of your way to help me. Thank you so much. Zakallah khair. One of the ways to thank people, and it's the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Jazakallah khair. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. But you're thanking him, but you're saying it. You're still asking for Allah to reward him, but you're saying it. It makes the person feel better. It makes the person feel that this person is acknowledging this, the, the help that I gave him. So it's a good thing. The person feels good as well. It's a motivation for him for next time as well, when he wants to help other people. So that was the first type of situation where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts our dua at face value. Whatever we ask for, Allah gives it to us. Ya Allah, I'm getting late for salah, help me. I'm getting late for salah. Ya Allah, help me. Make it in such a way that all the lights are green. Sometimes I do that. And sometimes that happens. All the lights are green. What is supposed to be a 15 minute ride takes me only three minutes. Sometimes that happens. And the second level where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the dua, He doesn't accept it at face value. You ask for something, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't accept that exact thing that you ask for for so many different reasons. Maybe it's not good for you. Maybe it's not good for you for the time being. Maybe it's going to harm someone else. Maybe it's going to make you more, it's going to make you ghafil of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's going to take you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's so many reasons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't accept that at face value. So instead of giving what you ask, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you an alternative. You ask for one thing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, that's not good for you. I'll give you something else. And you know those things in life where all of a sudden something good happens to you? Maybe that could be a re a, one of the du'as that you've made and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't, didn't accept that du'a. And the third situation is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this life uh, let's just say a person is going through trouble after trouble after trouble and he's just making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all he's going through is trouble he makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he says ya Allah you're just putting me through trouble remember we can't complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we can just say ya Allah I am weak I am going through this trouble ya Allah please help me in this situation so that person says, man, I'm going through trouble, and he speaks to himself, and I'm making dua to Allah, but he's not accepting my dua. He's not even giving me anything else. Everything's actually getting worse for me. It's not getting better in any way. Remember the third situation that, that a person might feel, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not accepting a dua? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saving the reward for the hereafter. He's saying that this person is strong enough to go through these hardships. So I'm going to give him the reward of these hardships as well. I'm going to give him the reward of his dua as well in the hereafter. It's not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot give that person. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that that person will be happier in the hereafter when he sees the reward for his dua. There is a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says that when a person, he will be in Jannah and he will see the rewards and the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him because of his dua, not because of his deeds, but because of his dua only. He will wish that none of his duas in this world were accepted. None of them. And everything was given to him in the hereafter. Because he would see the great, great blessings of one small dua. You make a small dua, Ya Allah, please help me in this situation. Ya Allah, please give me this. Or Ya Allah, please make this happen. And maybe that thing doesn't happen. And you went on with life. That, that, that time was over. It went on. You went on with life. And you forgot, you completely forgot about it. And just because of that small dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you such a great reward in the hereafter that we cannot even fathom, that we cannot even understand those type of rewards. So these are just different aspects of looking at dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, the ayah I recited at the beginning, He says, Udu'u rabbakum tadarru'u wa khufya. That, how do we make dua? That's another question. What does dua mean? One of the simplest and easiest ways to make dua is, first of all, we start off with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarati azul jalali wa ikram. We start off with the praise. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We glorify Him. Remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need our praise. It is for ourselves. But it's just a way of showing when you ask someone for something, let's just say you go to a king or a president and you want to ask him for something. The normal people, they would suck up to that person. They would suck up and they'd be like, oh, president, you know, you're such a great man. You're such a great man, even though he's not a great man. You're such a great man. You do such and such good things. You know, I need help in this situation. He knows that you're, you're asking for something. And if you just ask men, Yo, Trump, I need help in this situation. He might have not helped you. But if you say, 
Yo, you're such a good man. MashaAllah. You do such and such good work. And then you say, you know, I'm, I'm in a tough situation. He's going to be like, what do you need? When you praise someone before you ask them for something, it is more likely to get accepted. But that's with the world. Remember, when we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't need that praise. It is for us. It's the other way around, but it's just like a package that we put in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So first of all, we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we said salat and salam upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because scholars write that salat and salam is such a deed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always accepts that deed. Always accepts salat wa salam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because there is nothing in this deed that has any aspect of riya, of showing off to other people. No one says durood to show off to people. People have maybe nice cars, nice houses, or they do very, very good things in front of people to show off to them. But no one recites durood to show off to people. You ever hear of anyone saying, you know, I recited a thousand durood. No one shows off with durood. So that remember that deed, durood, salat was salam, is such a deed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always accepts that deed. Because there is no, there is not even an ounce of showing off to other people in that deed. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So many different ways of sending salat and salam upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So after praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we recite salat and salam upon the Prophet. Because if Allah, scholars write, if Allah accepts that deed, it is more likely that He accepts everything else as well. Because Allah is not stingy with, with acceptance. Allah is not going to pick and choose, okay, you said, you said praise, okay, that's good. Uh, you said durood, okay, that's good. But you know, the dua, it wasn't that good. I'm not going to really accept that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't do that. He doesn't pick and choose. It's... You recited durood, maybe just because of that durood that we recited, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept the entire du'a. <clears throat> and then the third way, the, the third step is to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for whatever we want. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions that when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Jannah, make sure you ask Him for Firdaus, Jannatul Firdaus. Don't just ask Him for Jannah. Ask him for Jannatul Firdaus. Meaning that anything that you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make sure that you ask him for the highest type of good. Don't just ask him for something small in terms of religion, in terms of the hereafter. Ask him for the highest that you can possibly imagine. But when it comes to worldly things, ask for whatever you need. Because if we ask for more than we need, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that that's not good for us. And we know that's not good for us. But sometimes we get greedy. And that's human nature. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows us better than ourselves. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might not accept what we're asking for in, in that situation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He says, Call on to your Lord, call on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say, Ud'u Allah, Ud'u Rabbakum. Call on to your Lord. He's your God. He's your Lord. He's there to help you. Tadarru'am wa khufya. Man, everything's dying. <laughs> so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, MashaAllah. Am I speaking too loud? Is it, is it too much for the mic? Okay. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Call unto your Lord, He's there to help you. In a way that you show humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can't say, Ya Allah man, you give it to me. Give it to me. No, humility. Ya Allah, I am weak. Ya Allah, I am, I am in such such situation. 
even if we're not weak at that time. Ya Allah, I am a human being. I make mistakes. We show our weakness in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We show humility in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tadarru'am wa khufya. And in such a way where <clears throat> call unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you're all alone. Making dua in front of people is good too. But remember, when you're alone, it is only you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there is no aspect of showing off to other people whatsoever. When it's only you and Allah, who are you showing off to the walls? There is no one. But if there's some people around, shaitan could put that inside our hearts, not ourselves. Obviously, no one wants to show off on purpose. It's shaitan that puts it into our hearts. So these are just some different aspects of looking at dua. I'm going to end off a little bit early, inshaAllah ta'ala, if that's okay. Is that okay? I can see everyone falling asleep. And that's the reason. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to make sincere dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us sincere in our dua. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness in this world and the hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if a dua is good for us, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept that. Also, one last thing before, before I get off, inshallah. There is one dua that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he mentions that if someone makes that one dua, he encompasses all the good things. And he also takes out all the bad things. Just by one, that one dua. The dua is a little bit lengthy. Allahumma inna nas'aluka khaira kullihi ajlihi wa... Allahumma inna nas'aluka min khairi ma sa'alaka min hunabiyuka wa habibuk Muhammadun sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa na'udhu bika min shabri ma sta'adaka min hunabiyuka wa habibuk Muhammadun sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And let me tell you the translation If you can't memorize the Arabic Everyone can know the translation It's very very simple Ya Allah I ask you for all the good That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Asked you for And I seek refuge in you From all the bad That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Sought refuge in you from So save me from all the bad That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Asked you to save him from and give me all the good that he asked you for. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala taught him directly. So if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew something was good or bad, he made dua for it. Ya Allah give me this, Ya Allah save me from this. So Allah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew the best form of dua. So at the end of our dua, after asking Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for all of our needs, we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for this dua. Or, or we can say it in any language. You, you don't have to say it in Arabic. Many times people think that you have to say dua in Arabic for it to get accepted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is better than Google Translate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows languages that we haven't even heard of. So many languages that we don't even know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows those. So any, any language we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, Allah knows that. Allah will accept that insha'Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all our du'as. Aqul qawri hadha wa astaghfirullah wa rakum wa risa'il muslimina min kulli dhammir fa astaghfiru innahu wa rafur rahim. Jazakum Allah.